Hey guys, going to try something different here for Hebrews chapter 4, and I've turned up the microphone volume on my computer to 100%, I guess it was only at 50, so that might help. Uh, but also, I'm using the Logic Capture software, um, and I have two monitors, and I have the eSword on one monitor, and uh, it's capturing the screen on that monitor. And then, so usually I use a program called Screencast-O-Matic, and I usually pay for like a year. It's like 30 bucks or something. It's not really a whole lot. That's something I've always used when I capture the screen and when I record like the eSword like this. But now I'm um, testing out this Logicam software, which is free, so you know I may not ever have to pay for that screen capture, uh, Screencast-O-Matic anymore. This seems to be a pretty good way to, to do this and um, I've also I've put the quality up to 720 again for the webcam and I've taken off the countdown before the recording it has an option to where you know when you hit record it'll say 3, 2, 1 and then recording and some people I've read I'm trying to figure out how to sync you know the audio and the video better and some, some people said removing that is helps so it'll just record automatically. So I'll have to get used to that. But I still want to record using my Bible. I'm just doing this for this one, just to try this um, capturing the screen with this program. And I was looking at getting some different programs to uh, record on besides Logi Capture because you know, when I record on here, I have to convert the video to MP4, and then I can edit it, and then I can upload it. And I was thinking if there are any alternative, you know, software that I can use, preferably anything that's free, you know, uh, where it will record automatically in MP4, so I don't have to convert it. I never really considered that before. So I've got some free time today, and I'm testing with some different things. But... Uh, Anyway, let's just go through Hebrews 4. This one looks maybe a little bit longer than some of the other ones have been. 16 verses. I don't remember what, how many were in the other ones. Um, so Hebrews... You know, I thought there was more... Okay, yeah, there are more chapters there. Four, let's see. First one had 14 verses. Second one had 18, so I guess that was more and then the third one had 19, which is even more, so I guess this isn't the longest chapter. But it says, Hebrews 4, 1, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left of us entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. And this is just continuing from the idea that we left off in uh, Hebrews chapter 3, where he's talking about, you know, don't have an unbelieving heart and basically telling them that, you know, they need to believe in Jesus to to enter into his rest, to get, you know, the promise. And let's go on to the next one. It says, For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith and them that heard it. And uh, I'm going to try to let's see, I can maybe take down the border a little bit. So, so who's he talking about? Us, and he's talking about them. Is he talking about the Jews and the Gentiles? Is the us the Hebrews and them the Gentiles? He says, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Okay. I think, I think I'm wrong about the Jews and the Gentile thing, or even questioning that. I think he's probably talking about, you know, supposedly Christians or people that are in the church or people that are supposed to be believers opposed to those who don't believe. Because the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. And so that 
makes me think of also the parable of the sower that Jesus, you know, gave about how, you know, some seeds fell in the stony ground and, um, you know, so basically not everybody that gets the message uh, takes it. You know, only the good soil is where it, it grew and, and bear, bear fruit. And so he's saying, and you know, it's all about faith, and he already talked about the, um, you know, an evil heart of unbelief, and he says how, you know, what matters is faith, and then here in verse 2, in Hebrews 4, he's saying that, you know, the gospel didn't profit them because they didn't have faith. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. He's referencing the Old Testament again. He's going back to Genesis too, but, you know, for we which have believed, so the emphasis is on faith. He said, do we which have believed which is kind of like past tense. I mean, if you can look at it that way. And he says, do enter into rest. It's a certainty. Those who have put their faith in Christ, you know, honestly, uh, genuinely believe, do enter into rest. And so I think he's just saying that within the congregation, there could possibly still be people who truly haven't put in their faith in Christ. People are going to try to make these verses seem like they're talking about losing salvation as someone can, can can start off believing and then come short. He talks about, you know, entering into rest, how on the seventh day, you know, God rested. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter their end, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Is he talking again? Is he going back to Moses? I don't know. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. So is he saying that some of these uh, previous times spoken of in the Old Testament were just types or shadows or figures of, you know, the ultimate rest, the other life in heaven uh, was the true spiritual meaning for he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor for, there, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. And so that seems like, you know, again, a loss of salvation passage that people would use for that or or a work salvation where it talks about let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. It sounds like the Bible's preaching work salvation, but it's not. And so I'd be interested to see what different commentators say about that verse, Hebrews 4.11. Uh, but, you know, it's also, it's just, again, it's contrasting belief and unbelief and... Um, He said before that those of us who have believed, you know, do enter into the rest. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And I've said that, you know, in dichotomy versus trichotomy, this is the verse that one of the only verses, maybe there's only maybe a couple of verses that people will try to use to teach 
trichotomy that man has a body, soul, and spirit. And this is one of those verses because it talks about the Word of God dividing the soul and spirit. And so people say, see, there's two different things there, the soul and the spirit. But, uh, you know, they're one and the same, and there's different ways to look at it there. And then, you know, you could also say, well, there's all kinds of parts mentioned here. Soul, spirit, joints, marrow, thoughts, the heart. <laughs> and basically, you know, man's made up of a, a material and immaterial parts. The two, this man's a dichotomy. And so, you know, he's got to be talking about, really, the gospel... And let me continue on to verse 13 because the East Sword says this is kind of the end of the section. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open as the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And so basically, I mean, I think he says, he's saying that, you know, God knows who believes in their heart and who doesn't. And you're not going to fool God in the end and, you know, be among the congregation and act as one of us. And then, you know, on the day when you die, when you go to enter into that rest, you know, when you go to be judged by the Lord, he knows that all along you never truly believed in him. There's no fooling God. God is omniscient. He knows all things. He knows our thoughts and our intents. And so, let's just continue the last section here, the last three verses, where the East Sword says, Jesus, the great high priest, Jesus, the great high priest. Hebrews 4.14, seeing then that we have a great high priest, which he uh, spoke of previously too, I think at the end of chapter 3. He does call him the high priest in the first verse. I thought he said it more towards the end of that, too, though. Hmm. Maybe it was chapter 2. weird though, I thought he was mentioned at the end of uh, chapter 3 or something. Jesus is mentioned as the high priest. Um, he says, let us hold fast our profession. Uh, and, you know, I don't know a lot about the high priest in the Old Testament and stuff, but I guess the, the, the high priest probably is, you know, the one that atoned for the, the, you know, he's the one that did the offerings or the blood atonements, you know, um, for people to... He did the rituals or whatever uh, for people to be cleaned of their sins. And so he was just a type of Jesus um, who really, uh, you know, his blood um, covers all sins. And 
he is eternal, unlike the earthly high priest who is temporary and and you know the offerings and stuff were temporary and they didn't really, you know, cleanse sins in the way that Jesus' blood does. He says in verse 15, For we have not a high priest and high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we were yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It talks about the sinlessness of Jesus. That's very important. You know, I just I'm confounded when people say that you know that men are without sin, and you know that definitely puts man at you know a level of of God, and it, it takes Jesus down to man's level, it takes God down. <laughs> I guess only Jesus was without sin. And you know, this doesn't and this doesn't just talk about the sin, sinlessness of Jesus, but I mean, I think that it just as importantly talks about the sinfulness of man, of all of us, of mankind. So what does it mean to that he, he cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities? You know, basically maybe the high priests of the Old Testament, you know, they, you know, they were born as men, they were sinners, you know, as all men are. But Jesus is a high priest who is completely sinless. And so, you know, what, that what he performed... Um, is you know much greater obviously so instead of stalling anymore I think I'll end this here but I'm probably going to try to record the other ones in my actual bible I just thought I would test this for future videos the screen, screen capturing software and you know I've messed with the microphone volume I want to see how that works hopefully it's not too loud but anyways thanks for watching let me know what you think God bless I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1-4. through 4. This is the Gospel, the Gospel of the grace of God, the good news that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to this earth, took, him, took on Himself the nature of a man, he was crucified and died for our sins, and He rose again on the third day. I want to ask you the most important question of your life. Your joy or sorrow for all eternity depends on your answer to this question. Are you saved? This has nothing to do with how good you are or if you go to a building called a church, but are you born again? In John chapter 3, verse 7, Jesus said, Ye must be born again. How can you be born again? First of all, you must realize that you are a sinner. Sin is anything in us that does not express or is contrary to the holy nature of our Creator, God. For instance, have you ever lied or cheated or stolen? These are all contrary to the character of God. The Bible makes it clear that all have sinned in Romans chapter 3 verse 23 when it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because you are a sinner, you are condemned to death. 
for the wages or the payment of sin is death. We read that in Romans chapter 6 verse 23. This includes eternal separation from God in hell. It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27. But God loved you so much he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, to bear your sin and die in your place. He hath made him to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21. Jesus had to shed his blood and die. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11. And without shedding of blood is no remission. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22. God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. Although we cannot understand how, God said, My sins and your sins were laid upon Jesus, and he died in our place. He became our substitute. It is true, God cannot lie. God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. In Acts chapter 17, verse 30, to repent means to turn around, to confess and forsake one's sins. It's a change of mind and a change of heart and a change of attitude that abhors sins. It agrees with God that one is a sinner and also agrees that Jesus died for us on the cross. In Acts chapter 16, verses 30 and 31, the Philippian jailer asked Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Simply believe on him as the one who bore your sin, died in your place, was buried, and whom God resurrected. His resurrection powerfully assures that the believer can claim everlasting life when Jesus is received as Savior. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. John chapter 1 verse 12. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans chapter 10 verse 13. Whosoever includes you shall be saved means not maybe nor can, but shall be saved. If you would like to learn more about sin, salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ, or anything else concerning the Christian faith, please visit www.acceptgbconverted.com.